I trim my nails into the drain's circular hunger, and I am today's first bathroom manicurist. The sink is what Foucault would call a heterotopia, a space of confused purpose. Wash hands, teeth, and a pair of quick dry travel boxers all in a couple hours? I can't believe it. My roommate can't believe it. My father can't think how to tell his colleagues what I'm doing. You could say I'm a poet, but only right now, typing as noon sups on morning's overcast oatmeal, and I ask the clock for just another half hour before I have to feed the appetite of my bike to a destination, only right now am I a poet. I am also a personal chiropractor. Want an adjustment? Sit up straight. That, that'll be $30. Consult my secretary for our next appointment. I consult my wallet for an answer to the cashier's hand, which is employed as a flower to photosynthesize nickel reflected light into food for the till, and in feeding it, I am a botanist and an accountant. The IRS, of course, won't believe me, will ask for my receipts, a couple thousand dollars, and more time on the phone with them than I can assemble from tomorrow's spare parts. What am I, a watchmaker? Whenever I wear the watch an ex gifted me on the wrist I broke one summer, trying to be a wide receiver in the park's idea of a football team, it breaks out in a rash. As you can imagine, my wrist doesn't do its job very well. Which, when a low pressure front depletes the horizon's light, is to be a barometer. Which, when it's been broken, is to heal itself and, once healed, to pretend it's never been broken. Which is the skeleton's industrious beauty to always be knitting itself into a blanket to cover the wrongs the hard world did to it. When people ask where I'm from in this hard world, I resist saying my suitcase, resist my passport, my father's orders. When people ask what my father does, he travels, he obeys his orders, he's a diplomat, which really means Friday nights he's prepping muffin batter for Saturday's occasions, Sundays he's in the office reading cables, and weekdays, he is somewhere that is not the here that you and I are sharing now, where I am really just myself, stringing words together like I'm following a difficult knitting pattern. And where are you from, I would like to ask. Because it answers implicitly, what do you do? You being you, the longest career you'll ever follow, all the way to the point where the only swerves allotted you are the letters of your name etched above you, filling with each shadow your parents conjured you out of, and thus eventually into. There are ashes in the demon's milk tonight is one way to talk about the stars, if we're talking about the stars, that is. One way to talk about the stars is three ways to break into the vault of solitude, which no, I'm not asserting there is one, that there's only one. A tabloid prattles, we are all stars. We are all star quality, made of stars, 15 minutes away from being and from not being stars. All of us are machine from fission and frisson. All of us are minutes from being here and burning there, which is the motion of the stars flashing carnally encoded smiles above a sequined wave of cleavage. This, by the way, is a way to talk about the stars, about cleavage as a means of joining as a means of separating stars from stars, everything in between. Wave as a means of collecting and depositing all the rocks the sea once knew. Waves as a means of dismissing all the constellated talk about the stars is one way to talk about the stars. One way to talk about the stars is thinking asterisk a dozen times, is drinking absinthe too many times, is straddling a gable glass in hand, the party swaying below you like kelp in an ebbing tide, like paper lanterns in an August breeze, and trying to lick the stars. Try to lick the stars. They have the sweetest knees I know. They send the sweetest notes. <laughs> I've, sh I've shown from green-built mountaintops the notes the stars exchange, the lines they write each other, the lines they write with our eyes, the lines they'd written with the eyes of people far gone and totally unfamous, except for the pictures they made on the sky to make the night reflect a little bit more of us. Another day, another ticket, the new saying goes. There she goes, traipsing on sock feet through the house, which isn't so much a house as a mausoleum for taste. Look, literally, the walls are furry. Striped in faux gray velvet, the carpets undulate in shag piles of roseate slosh, lamps light their own bronze nipples, and that's just the foyer. My aunt gamely pleads, don't let your eyes adjust, just skip on through the dark, there's nothing to see. 
Outside, low berries revolt on the pathways. Whale watchers ogle the backyard. A fluke of smoke escapes through the grill. Another day, another ticket from the local constable, my cousin, still growing into her smile. Fifty dollars, dirty feet. Twenty-five dollars, insulting an officer. Seventy-five dollars, having a squirrel on your face. <laughs> As I havoc back with a rusty hoe, the ragged berries I smoke. Forty-five dollars. Practicing cartwheels, my shirt slips, and she and I both remember suddenly I have tattoos. Ninety dollars. <laughs> On the driveway, we chalk a map of something to do with chalk, and she is happy, too distracted to ticket me as I scratch my waistline, the sun prickling up sweat, sprinkling high tide with pink, pastel, honeyed blink, marsh gas evanesce, etc., colors closer to my tongue than my eye. She's napping, and on lawn chairs by the water, my aunt and I toast gin, talk about today and tomorrow's projects. You know, she tells everyone about you. You're the cousin who smokes and has tattoos. <laughs> and we slip into giggling till it's time to wave the whale spotters by, which I do while thinking of telling Reese, my cousin, go find your other cousin down the beach after her second corona blowing smoke at the wind. Sorry, I lost myself. Blowing smoke at the wind, thinking, thinking of telling Reese, I don't have tattoos, tattoos have me thinking, what the hell, how can you feel indignant about this, about her, about candor, frankness, ingenuousness, about well-intentioned, rightly ingrained, distant finger-wagging? In a decade or so, when she's sitting here with us, squinting at the vintage of the day through a highball, I'll show her, her the post-its with all my finds on them. I've been using them as bookmarks, so I'll never lose them. I'll tell her I think of my skin the same way, sallow, creased, scrawled with the ink of thoughts whose sins have faded, each word and numeral marks a page I might not turn for years, but is waiting for the moment I know I'll want to. And so this is her response poem. Keep in mind, she's 10. <laughs> oh, Connor, I miss you like a bee, Mrs. Honey. Even though, <laughs> even though you smoke and have tattoos, you're one of the best people I have ever met, and I love you. Now I can bend my body in a really weird way. <laughs> I'm also learning how to do a back handspring. I'm unfortunately going to have to give you a ticket for writing a bad word in your poem, $118. <laughs> Loving kisses, Reese.